Hello, viewers, and welcome back to News for Our Future. Today we are interviewing Dr. Mary Evelyn Tucker. She is a professor at Yale University, where she is a senior lecturer and senior research scholar. She has appointments in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, as well as the Divinity School. She and John Grimm with host Brian Swim have recently produced a film and book entitled Journey of the Universe, a, an epic story of cosmic earth and human transformation. The book and video have very critical issues that um, are pertinent to our task, so it's important for us. Thank you, Dr. Tucker, for being with us today. Thank you so much. Good to be with you. Thank you. As you know, our task is a network of young adults, both high school and college, who are concerned about the planet that we are about to inherit. So we're looking for ways for humans to mutually enhance uh, the future of the planet. So we have degrees and profession interest in biology and law and economics. So you chose a rather unique career, one that blends scientific cosmology with religious traditions. So what, ch what made you decide to choose such an unusual career? Well, we really have to back up a little bit because um, I would say my life went in a special trajectory when I went to Japan in 73, 74, and I got very interested in the religious traditions of East Asia and studied Buddhism and Confucianism and Shinto and so on, but became very interested in what made people tick, what made societies work. And Confucianism is the DNA, the cultural glue, if you will, of all of East Asia. And so that was the tradition I came back and studied at Columbia University. So then all the world's religions were part of the program at Columbia, and um, that's where I got my first interest in. Right. Oh, that's great. So in your video and book, you have a, an acknowledgement of Thomas Berry that you seem to put out a lot. So why is Thomas Berry so important? Well, thank you for that question, because when I came back from Japan, I actually came back specially to meet him as well, because I wrote to him for his book on Buddhism. He was a scholar of Asian religions and had written on Buddhism and religions of India. And I was very eager to meet him because he had a huge and broad perspective. And Thomas Berry not only taught my husband and I, John Grimm, um, the world's religions, he was, had a program at Fordham, and that's where John and I first met. And his friend, Ted DeBerry, ran the program at uh, Columbia University. And Thomas not only understood the world's religions, but he understood that we were in a very critical environmental crisis moment. And that's what began our path towards understanding the world's religions and their ecological implications and environmental implications. And my studies in East Asia in particular made me realize as China and India began to modernize and over the last 35 and 40 years, the Asian landscape has been completely changed by rapid industrialization. And the consequence, of course, is the price is the environment. Yeah. So we kept thinking, what is it that can make a difference here? What kind of environmental ethics could grow up from the Asian soil that would be different from Western environmental ethics based on Christianity or Judaism and so on? So that's when we started a series of conferences at Harvard and began this new field of world religions and ecology 15 years ago that's now based at Yale. Oh, very interesting. So stepping away from Asia for a second, in your book and video you talk about a new story. What is the new story and why is it so important? Well, again, I have to um, give credit to Thomas Berry because, as I said, he studied these world religions and taught them brilliantly, but he also had this instinct that just as religions give people a sense of their purpose, their life meaning and direction, and how they're embedded into uh, the systems of the cosmos, that's what religions help us understand. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? And so he said, well, the world's religions need also to be linked up to science because science is giving us this tremendous story of our origins, which even 150 years ago, humans didn't know. So Thomas Berry wrote an article in 1978 called The New Story. 
And he said, we need to bring together the best of modern science from astronomy and physics and geology and chemistry and biology all the way down to the present to tell this epic story of evolution in a way that would inspire humans uh, for the continuity of that process. So the new story was Thomas's idea and that's what inspired us greatly to do this film and video, The Journey of the Universe. Oh great, so The Journey of the Universe is almost a continuing on of Thomas Berry's legacy. It is, and Brian Swim wrote a book with Thomas called The Universe Story, and it was published in 1992. That was the first time in book form this idea came out. And this is the first time in a film form that it's uh, been available. And it was a 10 year process to make this film a very, wow. very long, long process because it's not easy to get the science right, but also to bring it forward in a poetic and inspiring way that can be accessible to many, many people, both in academia but beyond academia. Yeah, I noticed in your video especially that the way that it's portrayed, even children in elementary and middle schools would be able to watch this and understand everything that's going on, which I really enjoyed. Well, that might be pressing it a bit much, no. but we hope that at least uh, for high school, it's for sure. Very and, accessible and college um, that it will be accessible and it is already being taught in some universities oh, and so that's the hope. The new story talks about, a, it's a new story, whereas the old faith traditions talk about, say, Genesis's account of creation. How are the faith traditions reacting to the new story? Well, this is a very new <laughs> Uh, event. The film um, just came out about six months ago and the book as well. So the whole project is relatively new. So really to answer your question, um, this is going to take years for, I think, for all of us to respond to it, absorb it. It's a change of mindset, a paradigm shift of, of how vast our evolutionary story is. So the world's religions will begin to pick it up and um, make a new synthesis with their theologies and their ethics. And that's being done somewhat in the Christian tradition. There's theologians who've picked this up in Latin America. Leonardo Bath has picked it up, um, a great theologian there, and so on. But it still needs to be rolled out. Great. So today it seems that the world, we as humans, are doing a lot of destructive things to the planet from pouring toxic chemicals into the oceans, deforesting the tropical rainforest, mass extinction of many species, especially the fisheries, that's one of the big things right now. What can the world do to try to stem the flow of all of these crazy things? I like your word, stem the tide stem of the destruction, tide. right? It's, it's really what we're about, stemming the tide of destruction. We're not going to reverse this moment fully, but Ed Wilson, the uh, scientist at Harvard, says we're going through an hourglass and extinction is happening. We are losing many, many species. We know this. And it's, um, it's heartbreaking. It's heart-wrenching. And as you say, the fisheries and the forest, um, these great resources that we somehow thought were inexhaustible, we realize they are not. And that's beginning to impact what we eat, what we think about, what we value. Uh, I've been vegetarian for almost 35 years because of concerns about these issues. Um, so what can we do, of course, is a central question. And I don't think we have any one answer to that big, big question. I think it's going to be on all scales, you know, on the local level, on the city level, on the bioregional level, how you're connected to your watershed and your bioregion, where does the food come, um, where's your water coming from and so on. But it needs to move up as well to state levels and state governments and a lot of state governments are doing very fine action about climate change, the New England area and California for example. And then the national level where it's been very hard to make uh, traction. Um, but, and the international level too, I think Americans are often uh, blind because our media doesn't f report fully what's happening on the international level that I think is a source of great hope and inspiration. Let me give an example. In 1992, the first Earth Summit took place in Rio, the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, this very contentious and still emerging uh, understanding of, of the effort to develop in the 
so-called developing world, and yet how can the environment be protected? That's been the last 20 years on the international level, a critical, critical conversation. And there have been so many conferences around this, which include habitat, women's issues, food issues, certainly climate change, and so on. Thousands and thousands of people have been involved in what I would call a major shift, a, a mega shift of realizing we are now inhabiting a planet that has finite resources, but that we have to create a common future. And without that sense, there will be no shared future without a common future. So the international conferences, I think, have pushed that conversation forward. Um, in Rio this summer, in June, there'll be a Rio Plus 20 conference uh, that I think will be very significant. And I think Americans, all of us, have got to join that conversation and not keep our borders um, closed. We've got to join the international community and the Earth community. In your book especially, and it's in the video as well, I love how you start from the very, very beginning and the large portion of it is just talking about how much has happened until humans existed. And I love that the end of the book is mostly about the humans and what we need to do in the future, but you really show that the human existence has been so short. Did you do that intentionally when you originally wrote the work? Absolutely, and it's, it's really an invitation, isn't it, into deep time. And when we get this sense of perspective of 14 billion years of universe evolution, it's almost incomprehensible. But if we start to study you know, the emergence of the galaxies and the stars and our planetary system, and as we say in the film and book, the stars are our ancestors because all of life came out of the supernova explosion. So that Thomas Berry used to say, this hand you know, is billions of years old because of a star exploding. Yeah. So it gives us that sense that our ancestry is ancient, way beyond even human history. And so it extends that sense that we're participating in a glorious and mysterious, and as Thomas used to say, a celebratory event. Um, so that continuity with life processes is, it decenters the human as you know, so important, and it recenters us within cosmos, earth, and humans. And that is, I think, an exciting change for all of us, that sense of deep time that will ground us and also give us a sense of what Thomas would call the great work going forward of our time. Aldo Leopold once said that the first rule of creative thinking was to save all the pieces, but humans tinker with the earth on a daily basis. We use all of its resources, but with all of this mass extinction and deforestation, we're not really saving all the pieces. So do you think rather than conservation, which if you think about saving all the pieces may not be working, do you think we should use geoengineering as a way to maybe bring back these ecosystems? Well, I think that's on the horizon of, of conversation with scientists and with funding efforts and so on, this geoengineering. But I myself am not very sanguine, not very hopeful that that is something we can actually do and we have no idea of the consequences of uh, putting things in the ocean or into the atmosphere and, and so on. Um, so the re-engineering of life, um, I think we need a precautionary principle around um, to say let's think about the consequences. We're talking today about Pinchot, who founded the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and he had a sense of management of the forest for the greatest good, for the long-term efficiency of the forest. But there's many people who include uh, Leopold who said, we have to have a land ethic. We have to have a sense that this is a biotic community and we're part of this biotic community. And so I would say that po points towards a holism, a holistic ecology. Well, it's interesting, isn't it, to imagine not only this long journey of our past, but the journey that's still ahead. And this moment of great transition, some people call it the great turning, um, is something that's gonna take centuries 
And it, it's not going to happen in decades. It's not even going to happen in our lifetime, for sure, yours or mine or even your children's. Um, but I think as we develop these larger sensibilities, a consciousness of deep time I've spoken about, a affirmation of space that connects us from the microcosm of our home to our larger planetary context, to the solar system and out. That's developing a new mindset, right? And the sense then of what we are going to preserve in, in a new collective sensibility is absolutely crucial. And Americans have valued, and I certainly value as well, individualism, but we've got to take these enlightenment virtues of the French Revolution and so on and reconfigure them. So from hyper-individualism, you know, it's all about me, to a new sense of a collective common good that we need to redefine American society and its future. So we work largely on this principle level. You know, how can the world's religions make this shift um, and expand their ethical sensibilities? How can we tell this epic of evolution in a way that is inspiring and um, not uh, either degrading of human hopes or energy? Um, and finally, I think we have to recognize that all the institutions that we used to rely on for guidance, like educational institutions, political institutions, religious, economic institutions, all of them are being transformed and reconfigured. Many of them, in fact, are even breaking down. But there's a, like the economic institutions of our moment and having immense consequences, not only in our country, but around the world. But if we can sense somehow that below the surface something is emerging, namely the breaking down, there's a breaking through to institutions that will be able to guide us, that will have larger leadership sensibilities. And again, I think your generation has immense possibility of doing this. Um, it's why ecological education, environmental education is absolutely critical for all of us into the future. And I think we can do this for sure. For this global task to work, we need it to be a global thing that's happening. So how do you think we can set up these global institutions to create this new future for the Earth? Well, again, an excellent question. And a lot of people are not so uh, hopeful about some of these global institutions or conferences, and they think they're unwieldy and sort of beyond uh, being efficient or efficacious and so on. And that's true, that's true up to a point, but there are networks that are happening below the surface. People, and that is true because of the internet as well, but some of the face-to-face -face context, context has really changed people's views. But the institutions, for example, in the Rio Plus 20 conference this June, um, the two themes are global governance and global green economy, green economy. So with global governance, people are trying to rethink what's the role of United Nations Environment Program? Do we need a world environmental organization? You see, like a world trade organization exactly. to counterbalance that. So that's in discussion right now. So that's part of the institutional rethinking, reshaping, okay? The green economy is hugely robust in, in terms of discussion. Can we create an economics that actually accounts for environmental damage that's not just about profit for corporations, but also the consequences for people and planet? So I think these, the discussions are well underway, as I say, at least for a decade on how the, a new economy has to emerge and how new environmental institutions have to emerge. It won't all be resolved in Rio, but exactly. it's underway. I loved in your book and video how you talk about the evolution of the world from the stars to earth to the animals, but you talk in your book about symbols and how humans, it's not that we're really evolving, it's that we got language and symbols and now we're evolving statically with things, not so much with our DNA. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Your question, which is such a good one, is um, we're at a moment of cultural evolution as well, right? So the processes that 
have gone through a natural selection and mutation and change uh, with all of the dynamics of evolutionary laws and, and scientific laws um, are now being reshaped, not always to the good, um, by our actions. And of course, by going from two billion to six billion people in one century, you know, we exploded to be an octopus presence around the planet and sucking up resources and, and so on. So that explosion and the industrial revolution that accompanied it and the medicine that advanced our lifespan, all of it has contributed to this very critical moment. But they were these were unintended consequences. We didn't intend to destroy the life systems of the planet, but it happened in a geological instant. So the challenge now is cultural evolution. How do we take what is probably our most distinguishing characteristic, symbolic consciousness? If we say self-reflexive consciousness for the human, which includes language and symbol and art and music and the ability to recognize our critical moment, then we have perhaps a doorway to change, to shift. Because symbols have inspired the human from early cave painting all the way up to the Renaissance in Europe of Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci and the incredible art of Asia, of Buddhism and, and Confucianism and so on. So we have